How are we doing? Well, good to be with you tonight. It's always an honor. Uh, over the last few weeks, we've been going through the Ten Commandments. We've looked at the fact that we've actually learned that there are the first four commandments speak to us about the, our relationship to God, how we relate to God, how we, re, how, we, how we have a relationship with God, or how we build a relationship with God is through the first four commandments. Then the next six commandments talk about our relationship to one another. So over the last few weeks, we've, we've discussed some of these commandments, but I want to take a moment right now just to walk through the ten that we've uh, talked about the last few weeks, just so you know right where we're at tonight. Let's do this. It says, list, here we go, you shall have no other gods before me. Do not make for yourself any idol. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. Honor father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. And you shall not covet. Tonight we're going to look at the fourth commandment on this list. We're going to look at this through the book of Exodus. Exodus 20. I'm going to read. If you want to take, take a moment to find that in your Bibles, I'll give you just a moment to get there. Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Or it's right behind me. Let's read this. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and made it holy. In the 1990s, uh, late 1990s, there's a movie that came out called The Truman Show. Have you guys seen The Truman Show? <laughs> the Truman Show. It's a great movie. This guy wakes up in this, uh, this uh, story, this movie, not realizing that he is uh, the center of that story. He's the primary actor. He actually was born into this reality show that he didn't even realize was a reality show. It was The Great Deception. There's really three major groups in this uh, story. There's first the, care, the, the creator, the creator of the Truman Show. He's kind of the, the one that's kind of deceiving Truman the entire movie. He has this henchman that deceived Truman from Truman's wife to his best friend. All the people around him deceive this man. The second group is really the savior. There's this woman that breaks into the story, and she shares with Truman the truth. And then there's Truman. He's the deceived. He's the person that's been deceived by the creator of the story. And he's been deceived by all the people in the story. This great deception is an amazing story. And I want to show you a clip right now that takes us right into the middle of this crossroad that he faces. He looks at the, at the, he looks at the deception and the option to stay in that deception, to stay in that comfort zone of that deception, or he has an opportunity to realize the truth and then begin to live in that truth. Let's check out this clip. I know you better than you know yourself. I never had a camera in my head. You're afraid. That's why you can't leave. It's okay, Truman. I understand. I have been watching you your whole life. I was watching when you were born. I was watching when you took your first step. I watched you on your first day of school. <laughs> the episode when you lost your first tooth. <laughs> you can't leave, Truman. Jeez, God. You belong here. With me. Talk to me. Say something. Well, say something, goddammit. You're on television. You're live to the whole world.
In case I don't see you. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs> yeah. I love that scene. Can you relate to Truman? You have the voice of the deceptive creator speaking in his ear, saying, this is a life you can't leave. You've got it all here. Stay in the deception. Own the deception. Love the deception. I know your story. I was there when you first lost your first tooth. I was there, the great deceiver. Then you have this woman in that, in that scene where she actually prays to God, help Truman. And in the next scene, the man curses God and blasphemes his name, right? And then sure enough, at the end, Truman now makes his great descent to move on into that dark space, the, the unknown of choosing his path. Can you relate to Truman? I can relate to Truman. I, I used to live in a wood ranch by the golf course with a few, uh, few guys. Yeah, there we go. Wood ranch, okay. There we go. All right. <laughs> I, I lived with a couple guys by, in Wood Ranch Golf Course, and it was pretty crazy. Uh, the whole atmosphere was disorderly, from the, how, how late we stayed up at night, to the weekends, to the parties in the house, to the holes in the wall, to the jobs we hated, to the way we treated each other at times. It was just disorder all the time. And I, I remember sitting on my blue suede couch, looking at my friends. I literally had a blue suede couch. Looking at my friends, you know, this is, uh, this, this is like the ultimate guy's pad. I'm looking at my friends and going, are these guys as miserable as I am? I just, I just couldn't seem to get over it. I was so miserable, but they seemed so happy. So I'm looking at them. I'm looking at myself. I'm going, I got to get out of here. And so like Truman, I had a moment where I just moved out. Went, I rented a room across town because I had to get away from the deception that was going on in my home, even there in that moment and Wood Ranch. Are you living your life right now in a way that you know is just not quite right? You know, we have this uh, deceptor, this creator deceptor in our story at times, but then we have an option to know and trust the creator God. Over our fourth commandment today, we're going to learn a very powerful truth that should really rule part of our life. And it's this, when you know and trust the creator God, you will be able to experience life the way it was designed to be. No more deception, but when you know, the, know and trust the creator God, you will be able to experience life the way it was designed to be. Tonight we're going to go through three either ors. Either ors in regards to the Sabbath. The first one is, God is asking us, do you want to be a slave or free? And then God asks us, do you want to be a human or an animal? And then God asks us, do you want life or do you want death? The first one we're going to look at is free or slave. Let's read our text. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. First thing that's happening here is that Moses is talking to the nation of Israel. He's looking at them. He's talking to them, talking to them clearly about keeping the Sabbath and making sure they keep it holy. Now, that remember word really is, I would say, threefold meaning here. He's looking forward to the fact, actually, he's, he's looking backwards to the fact that God is the creator and that we serve a creator God. And the creator, it says in our passage here, created the earth in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. So not only did he do that as an event, but he also displayed his nature. Our God is a creating and working God. There's, there's, a, there's an idea, a concept called the Imago Dei. Not only does God have his own nature, but he's actually given us his nature, and we're made in his image. Otherwise, the Imago Dei, made in God's image. So God not only creates the planet, but he also shows us who he is by creating the planet, and then he invites us to live in that same created uh, nature to reflect God's nature. 
Now, God didn't go, uh, because you're so weak and frail, you have six days of work, and now I'm going to give you a day off because you're just that weak and you couldn't work seven. And, and God wasn't so weak that he goes, man, after six days, I was wiped out. I needed to have a day off. That's not the nature of God. If you read the Bible for what it is, you let the Bible teach you what it says about God and reveals to you who God is. The truth is, when God took that day of rest off, he rested in his strength, he rested in his majesty, and he rested in his power. And so he invites us in the same way to rest in our strength, in our wisdom, and in the power that he gives us, not just in our weakness. That's the first thing that Moses is telling them to remember. God the creator. The second thing is that he wants them to remember the God who saves. The nation of Israel was in slavery for 400 years. God was pulling them out, or God pulled them out of slavery, brought them through the land, land of the wilderness, taking them to the promised land. God showed them his compassion. He showed them his mercy through drawing them out of the nation of Egypt. The third thing he wants us to see as far as remembering is that God is the one who provides. So not only did he draw them out of Egypt to the promised land, but in, that, in the midst of their trials, they were in a land, I would say, a place, a season called wilderness. And in that wilderness, God provided a, a food called manna. And manna was this uh, bread-like kind of wafer material that would emerge from the earth supernaturally every single day, only enough to provide food for that day. And so God, every single day, six days a week, would provide this food that they would work to get, and they would put it together, and they would give it to their family, they would give it to their community. But on the seventh day, he would not provide that food. But more importantly, on the sixth day, God would provide a double portion so that they can rest on that seventh day. So Moses is saying, God's the creator. He's the God who creates. He's also the God who saves. And he's saying, remember, God is also the God who provides. God is the God who provides. We see that not only in this Sabbath provision did God provide a day of rest for us to reflect his nature, but he's also setting, setting a, a new standard for order for the people of Israel. It's amazing stuff. For example, if you were a slave for six years, you were set free on the seventh year in, in, in Jewish culture. Or if you were a farmer and you farmed for six years, you were to let the land rest on the seventh year. And then also another Sabbath-type principle was after 50 years, if you were a man where people had debts they had to you, and you, otherwise people owed you money, on that 50 year, 50th year, you would set them free of their debts. How much like God to draw them into a day of rest, to give their slaves freedom after seven years, to let the land rest for seven days, and then to set all people free from their debts after 50 years. This is the way that God uh, brings back order and that Moses is asking them to remember. Now, that remembering is not like a husband who remembers his anniversary on, on you know, an anniversary day, and he just remembers and goes, wow, great, this is my anniversary today. Not just a thought of remembrance, but he's a husband that remembers his anniversary day, goes to the store and gets the perfect flowers, goes and gets the perfect card and writes his heart in that card. He finds the great reservation for his wife for that dinner. Then he takes her away to Santa Barbara for the weekend. Whatever it is, God, this, this husband has a plan to remember his wife, right? And so when Moses is saying remember, he's talking about that remembrance that's action-oriented for the people of Israel. And that holiness, that holiness that flows from that remembrance. The commandments are always meant to be this uh, pointer to the nature and love and mercy of Christ. The commandments were never meant to burden us down and, and uh, be a, a yoke on our back, a yoke of weight, a yoke of struggle for our backs. It's always meant to give us freedom and hope. So when we think about the commandment of the Sabbath, we have, to, we have to point it always to Christ. And Christ had a real confrontation with people who were too legalistic about the Sabbath day. There's an example in Matthew 11. There's this time where his disciples are going through this, uh, I would say, a, a hill country where there's grain on the sides of the streets and sides of the, the rocks beside them, and the disciples pick up some grain. They begin to eat the grain. And before you know it, one of those legalists shows up and goes, look, your disciples are breaking the Sabbath. How's that possible, Jesus? Now, of course, Jesus in his normal style, he stands before those Pharisees, and he says, 
don't you know the scriptures? Haven't you read the scriptures? On one hand, don't you remember that King David, God's anointed man, when he was running from Saul, he had to run into the temple and eat the consecrated bread, therefore breaking the Sabbath. But God protected him and honored him in that. God was always creating the Sabbath for man and not man for the Sabbath. So Jesus tells him that. And he goes, also, don't you remember the scriptures that when the priests in the Mosaic law created the ceremony on Sundays, or on, on, on the Sabbath day, they had to work every day to prepare for that Sabbath day. So therefore, the priests also broke the Sabbath, but God called them innocent. So Jesus says to them, you are missing the point of the Sabbath. Because if you knew the point of the Sabbath, you would know what Hosea 6.6 6 says. It says, I desire a steadfast love. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. The whole time God is seeking a loving people that seek to love him and care for him and support him and worship him and follow him. He's not looking for sacrifice. So Jesus puts this man on display. And at the very end of that statement, Jesus goes, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Pointing back to him again. God is always teaching us that it's about his love. You might be looking at me today and thinking about this uh, question, uh, how do I observe this Sabbath then? How do I do this whole Sabbath thing? You know, we have in the Old Testament, it's clearly the seventh day of the week, but what happens in the New Testament? Well, I want, I want to commend to you that I, I believe the Bible teaches us that Sundays is that day that we are to gather and observe uh, the Lord's Day, a day that we honor him, serve others, care for others, worship our God, fellowship, do activities with our friends, celebrate the freedom of rest. I believe that's what the Bible teaches. And in fact, after Christ uh, dies, is buried, and resurrects from the grave, he begins a new season. Where in that new season, the first day of the week is a time where the Sabbath is observed. It says, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb, John 21. So right away, out of the gate, Christ raises from the, raises from the dead on the first day of the week. And then also it goes on to uh, John 20, 19. It says, so when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were, for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. And then even over in Acts, the book of Acts, you get Peter. On the first day, it says, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began to talk to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight, Paul. And then finally, the apostle John talks about the Lord's day, this day of rest. He says in the book of Revelation, he's, he's now beginning to get this revelation from God. But before he gets that, he recognizes that I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice, the sound of a trumpet on the Lord's day. So I believe there's wisdom in us looking to that first day of the week, that Sunday, to honor that Sabbath principle, that Sabbath idea on that first day. But you might, you might be thinking right now, but I, I work on Sunday, or I work on Saturday, or I have a schedule that changes a lot, and I can't always be there on the weekends. Well, I want to encourage you, because the Apostle Paul says this in Romans 14.5. He says, one person regards one day above another, and another regards every day alike. Each person must fully, must be fully convinced in his own mind, in his own mind. Therefore, this is not a law that you want to become a weight in your life. The principle that God wants us to have is that we want to honor him on that day, that Sabbath day. So that could be technically any day of the week that you can honor the Sabbath day. I think ideally it's a day where you can gather and worship. Ideally it's a day where you can begin to grow spiritually and invest in your spiritual growth. You can invest in taking time apart to hike, have, fr have fun with friends, fellowship, have a barbecue, enjoy what God has given you. But ideally it's that Lord's day. But he's open for the other days as long as you're honoring him with that day. But I, I have a warning for you as you're thinking about entering into that rest day. 
I think for all of us, we want to have a pattern in our lives where that pattern is not just the Sabbath day is the day of rest, but that the, that the Sabbath would just kind of spill over into the other days of our life, our, our Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, that we'd have moments of rest that would point to that Sabbath rest. I, I have a story that might surprise you, but... Um, this last week, I, uh, it was 4th of July, my family and I, we went to Fraser Park on a, on a camping trip. It was a great time, we had a, we had a really, really nice time, we got back on Saturday. I went straight to the garage, I cleaned the garage out, I, I, I worked all night until probably the sun almost came up or went down, and then the next day, on Sunday, I worked, I had some duties here at church, and then on Monday, I, I had a hard day. I had some hard meetings, and I, I was just kind of wiped out, and I came home, and as soon as I got home, my wife hands me the baby. And then uh, she says, it's time for you to make dinner. <laughs> and, and then I, I go, and I, after that moment, I go outside to take a phone call, and my, my kids are on the side of the yard, and my daughter's riding a bike, and my son's holding the handlebars and not letting her go. And she's screaming, screaming hysterically, Daddy, help me. And in that moment, I look to my kids, and I go, in my, in my heart, in my heart, I said, will you shut up and let me rest? <laughs> it wasn't the smiling shut up and let me rest, though. It was the real shut up and let me rest. I've been working. I gave you, I gave you the last four days. Will you give me one day? So the warning is that we don't want the Sabbath. We don't, we don't want to go into the Sabbath day saying, shut up, boss. Shut up, girlfriend. Shut up, boyfriend. Shut up, world. Shut up, problems. Shut up, life. I just want to sit on my couch and binge on Netflix. Shut up. You don't want to enter your Sabbath day like that. That's not God's design for you or his path for you. This great uh, writer named Andy Crouch writes this. Uh, he has this quote in his book called TechWise Family. He says, we are designed for a rhythm of work and rest. So one hour a day, one day a week, one week a year, we turn off our devices, and we worship, we feast, we play, and we rest together as a family. So this is a rhythm of rest that you could take into your life. And so when we think about being free or being a slave, we recognize that God creates us for freedom in this rest, and not slavery to all the things that are calling our names all the time. So how are you doing with your Sabbath? What's calling your name on your days off? How are you finding rest on your Sabbath day? Do you feel like you're a slave to the demands of every day? Or do you feel free to rest in that Sabbath day? The next thing God wants to ask us is, is, is this. Are we human or are we animals? Are you human are you an animal? The passage says this. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. And you and your son and your daughter and your male and your female servant and your cattle and your sojourner who stays with you shall do no work. And so... Picture like this, you don't work, and then you make sure your kids, you make sure you don't pass the work on to your kids, right? And then you don't pass the work on to your servants, and then you don't pass the work on to your cattle, and then the, the person who's staying with you from a foreign country, who's not really a Jew, according to Moses, you don't have that guy work because he doesn't serve God either. You give that guy a break too. And so the whole way, you're giving the foreigner a break, the cattle a break, the servant a break, your children a break, and you're giving yourself a break on this day. That's the how. Now, you have to remember the context here. Moses is talking to the people of Israel 400 years in a pagan, idol-worshiping culture. 400 years of these people intensely and purposefully trying to ruin their Jewish identity. So these are people who were treated like products, commodities. They were treated like people with no identity. 
They would seek to break apart all of their cultural identity. And one thing they had that was very different in Egypt was that they had 37 weeks that were 10 days each. So you can imagine, no matter how many days there were, I'm sure they didn't have many days off. But nevertheless, it was a very different calendar than the Israel calendar. And so the whole concept of being made in God's image and having rest and, and reflecting God's nature is taken from them. And now they've become slaves and idol worshipers. And now with the Egypt calendar, every single season was to worship a different God. And so they had to obey that and had to observe that to some degree. So it's just this whole dehumanizing of the people of Israel. And so through the Sabbath day and taking it away and having them work like slaves and like commodities, they dehumanize the Israelites. And that dehumanizing becomes a deep part of their culture. Can you imagine 400 years? All you know is that you're a slave and you don't mean anything. You're worthless. But then God brings them out to make sure they realize they are made in his image and they are human. All around the world, there, there are these things called sweatshops. Sweatshops are places where people work night and day to provide a product. Let me give you some stats about these sweatshops. A place where people are dehumanized because they remove the Sabbath. It says, in developing countries, it's estimated that there are 250 million children between the ages of 5 and 14 who are, focused, who are forced to work in sweatshops. Most of them are forced to work 16 hours days. Children in Asia as young as five were reported to work 13 hour days, 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. And then between 10 to 25 percent of children in, under the age of 16 in Latin America work in sweatshops in India, about 5 percent to 30 percent of the 300 40 million children under 16 are classified as child laborers. Fast forward to this, uh, this group called ASSL um, League claims that Nike workers die by the age of 15. Many Nike workers die by the age of 15, making the shoes. And then finally, sweatshop workers' wages can be as low as one cent, one U.S. cent per day, and they work up to 100 hours per week in conditions of poor quality and extreme heat. This concept of not resting is not just about having a day off, but it's about your humanity and the fact that people all over the world are dehumanizing people that are made in God's image by disobeying the Sabbath. People all over the world are being dehumanized like the Israelites, like these people in sweatshops. And I, and I believe for us, we as humans are creators. We as humans make fire, right? We as humans imagine things. We as humans worship God. We as humans have a role in society. We as humans have been called by God to care for others. Be called by God to support the least of these. Called by God to be focused on social justice in our world. But people are being dehumanized by a lack of the Sabbath, a lack of rest in their lives. There's a book called When Helping Hurts. Chapter 4 of this book gives kind of a framework for how to help people. And I think about this framework connected to the Sabbath. The first one is you want to bring relief. When someone's going through something, typically if it's a serious crisis, the relief you bring is a cup of water, a warm meal, a hug, a place to stay, Anything you, do, you can do from a basic resource standpoint, you want to stop the bleeding. That's relief, right? The second one is rehabilitation. When someone's, going through, when someone's had a crisis, you're on the other side of that, trying to help them come out and recover from this major crisis in their life. So you're supporting them. You're, you're building them up. You're restoring them, restoring, up their, restoring their families, restoring their community, supporting how you can. And then finally, there's development. Development is where you walk with people to the point that you hope that your heart, the helper, and their heart, the helped, will, will meet together. And you could develop community together where you're, where you're, where you're, you're in the work with them. And I, I believe at the, at the core, 
at the core of us helping people in different nations or even in our own community. I think about our Tuesday meals program here on Thursday after, Tuesday afternoons. People come in, they're just trying to get a break from the heat. They just want rest from the heat. During the winter, they just want rest and they need a place to stay at night. Typically, you go to a different nation. These people are working around the clock to keep things going, or in some cases, they don't have a job. But nevertheless, the way we establish and serve and give them rest is by serving their needs and the relief, and then we develop ministries and programs to help them. We, do, we, do, we develop a, a Sunday service to preach God's word, to sing, to gather them together to see the grace of God. Then we send them out to become ministers, and we, we develop them all around the Sabbath day. And that's our main strategy as a church, is to build that day of rest in people's life to bring back the humanity in broken cultures. This is the Sabbath. Are you an animal or are you a human? When we allow work to become our idol, when we allow business, business to become our idol, we dehumanize ourselves. God wants us to rest because we are reflecting the nature of God. So who are you helping to stop the bleeding? Who are you helping to stop the bleeding in their life? Is there someone in a crisis in your life? How are you helping them? Are you, are you becoming an agent of rest in their life? Let's think real fast again through this level of the how that we talked about in this, this, uh, this commandment. You see, before it was don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. But now, the person you are, you get to give your children rest. And then you get to give your servants rest, a day off to work. Then you get to give your, cattles, your cattle rest. Then the foreigner among you, you get to support them and bring them to your table and rest. You become an agent of rest for those around you. But the bottom line is you can't give what you don't have. You need rest in order to give rest. The final thing we're going to look at is life or death. Life or death. Life or death. God is asking us, do you want life or death? Have you seen the life or death in the Sabbath? It says here, because in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And so we see clearly, as we saw a moment ago, that God is creating the earth, establishing the Sabbath, and this is the picture we see in Exodus. But we can't fully understand it until we look at Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, we have the same type of picture where it says, if you keep the Sabbath, he says, you keep the Sabbath because you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there by his mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. I want you to picture that. This is God the Father. His mighty hand crushing the people who dehumanize your brothers, your sisters, your mother, your great-grandfather, your great-great-great-grandfather. They just ruined so much of your culture. This mighty God, with his mighty hand, breaks down that barrier. And in his outstretched arms, his compassion, he draws you in. He says, bring this to me. I want to save you out of this. See, it's not just about the fact that he saved them from Egypt, but he's pointing to a greater salvation. Egypt's a picture of a greater salvation. He finishes the passage with, therefore, the Lord blessed the day, blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. You see, only, only one day out of the six days did God bless and say this is holy. So therefore, God is pointing to this as a very important day because not only is he the creator, but he brought you out toward salvation. And we have, in, we have in Hebrews 4, 8 through 11, where God is talking to us through the writer of Hebrews. And he's saying to us that this Jesus, he transforms everything. Yeah, I, I know Moses uh, was faithful and he was an amazing prophet for God's kingdom. And he brought, people almost, he brought God's people almost all the way to the promised land. But then he passed it off to Joshua. And then Joshua, he brought, he brought God's people all the way into the promised land. He brought them to the place of rest. And so you know, God's saying, I know that happened. I know Joshua did a good job with that. He was faithful in that. He's amazing in that. 
But, but let me tell you what really is going on here. He goes, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. See, the rest that God gave them in promised land, or that God gave them in, in that blessing of being brought out of Egypt to the promised land, was just one day. But there was another day that was to come. It says, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. So let us, let us, let me, let you, let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that rest. Every effort. Think about every effort. Make every effort in your life to enter into that rest. You got to turn the TV off that day. You got to make an appointment on your calendar for that day. Make every effort. But this rest he's talking about is not just that day. It's the rest of salvation. Because that true rest, who's that rest? That rest is Christ. And he says here, enter that rest that only comes through the resurrection of Christ. Enter that rest so that no one will perish. We have to remember that Christ did not come to give us our best life now. Christ came to give us our best the best life we can have now, but the abundant life for eternity. He's going to bless us today, but this is not the end of the story. God saves us from sin, death, and hell. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Death. The gift of God is eternal life. So when it says here, strive to enter into that rest so that no one will perish. We're calling people out of, out of death to life. Out of death to life, he says, oh, that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. God doesn't want anyone to perish. He, he wants us all to realize that we are free. He wants us all to realize that we are humanity. We, we, we look at Christ, the perfect man, and we want to reflect his humanity, the compassion, the love, the ingenuity, the wisdom, the, the skill, all those things that humans do. We want to be human. We also want to be people who realize eternal life. We learn that God is calling us to Christ. That the Sabbath day, yeah, it's, it's about a day of rest. Absolutely. We all should be, we, should, we all should be uh, wor working our hearts every, every day Resting along the day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, whatever it is, to that day of rest and finding those moments of rest. God wants, us, wants that for us. But he also wants us to realize how we're made. Realize that he's the creator and he's designed us for a greater purpose. And that purpose and that plan is pointing us towards the Sabbath rest, who is Christ. And that we strive to enter that Sabbath rest. We think about um, how this all happens. Christ clearly says, come to me, and I will give you rest. We see the story starting with creation, with the six days and one day off. It, ends, it, it goes to Christ, the Sabbath rest, and then he points us towards new creation, new heavens, and new earth. New heavens and new earth is the heaven that we're all looking forward to, the hope that we're all seeking in our lives. Life is tough. Burdens come. Struggles come. You want to say, shut up to people sometimes. But God's calling you out of that attitude, calling you out of the tr challenge you're facing, calling you out of anxiety, calling you out of depression, calling you out of struggle, calling you out of addiction, calling you out of idolatry, calling you out of using God's name in vain, calling you out of worshiping other gods before him. He's calling you to the day where you have pure rest, true rest. You come to the cross in awe. You come to the cross saying, arms open wide, I see you, Christ. You, you poured your blood out for me. I, I bring it all to the cross. Because the Sabbath rest I'm looking for is the salvation that you offer me in your son, Jesus. I bring it all to you, Christ. I give it all to you. I, I want you to bring all your stuff tonight to the cross. The Sabbath rest is Christ. And he wants us to bring it all to him. Because at the end of the story, there's this amazing moment where he says in Revelation 21, he, he, he says, no more crying, no more mourning, 
No more struggle. No more dying. No, that, that's, all, that's all gone. He says, because I'm making all things new. He goes, it's done. I'm the alpha and the omega. I'm the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, to those who are thirsty, I will give the one who is thirsty from the spring of water of life without cost. Get that. You didn't pay for it, right? You didn't pay for it. Christ paid for it. But now he's going to give you it, that Sabbath rest for eternity. He wants you to bring it to him today. That Sabbath rest. He brings to you. If you are thirsty, come to him and drink because he will give you for eternity. And then he says this. And those people who want that Sabbath rest, they can come. And when they come and they overcome all the challenges, they overcome all the struggles, they overcome all the days that are hard, they will inherit all these things I gave to my son Christ. And I will be their God, her God, his God. I will be their God. And, I, and, and they will be my people. They will be my sons. And I will walk with them. I will talk with them. I will be their light. But then we think about the fact that this is, this is the message for those who desire that Sabbath rest. He wants to release you from the burdens if you thirst for that Sabbath rest. But for those who don't thirst for that Sabbath rest, he has a different plan for you. It's not a plan that he wants because Jesus says, I desire that none would perish, but all would come to me. He says this, when you don't want to thirst, all those who are cowardly, all those who are unbelieving, all those who are abom abdominal, abominable, all of the murderers, all the immoral persons, all the sorcerers, all the idolaters, all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The Sabbath is about life and death. The Sabbath is about Christ. And he's calling us to himself. He looks at us and he says, there are two roads. One leads to life and it's narrow. But he says, come to that road and I will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Or there's another road that leads to destruction. It's broad and everyone will find it. No, not everyone, but many will find it. And on that road, he says, kind of what he says in Matthew 7, when you say to him, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. Lord, we did things in your, we did miracles in the streets. We know you. And he says, no, turn from me. You didn't thirst for righteousness. You didn't thirst for my rest. Turn from me. I never knew you, you worker of lawlessness. The roads you have to choose, they come to the cross. They come to this moment of second death that Christ is talking about here in Revelation. So I want to ask you, what will you hear on that day? Will you hear, well done, good and faithful servant? You wanted that rest. Or will you hear, turn from me. I never knew you. God designed us for a purpose. God designed us to be like him, the working and resting God. God designed us to be human, not animal. God designed us for eternal life. And he invites all of us to come. He invites all of us to come. Have you come to Christ? Have you come to Christ? Will you come today? He is that Sabbath rest. He wants to give you rest today for what you're going through. Bring it all to the cross. Are you deceived by the wrong creator? Are you deceived by the crowd who's telling you life's okay? Keep living this deceived life and it's okay. Are you tired of that? Come to, come to Jesus today. Bring your burdens to him. The good news is not just to save you. The good news keeps you. 
holds you, protects you, walks with you. The good news showers over you that he saved you for the Sabbath rest. That's the message. That's the message. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. You are our Sabbath rest. You invite us to be the change agents in the world around us. There's so much pain, so much division, so much struggle. How could we believe that this would all come back to a day honoring you and worshiping you? And if the whole world gave their life to the Sabbath, they would see your glory. They would see that you saved us. They would see that you brought us out of slavery. They would see that you know that we are valuable. When the world tells us we are valueless, you say that we are made in your image. When the world tells us we are worthless, you say that we have a purpose. Father, you are good. You are holy. You alone, Jesus. I pray we would come to you in that Sabbath rest every day. And we give a day to you, Father. Pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen.